The Day of the Rope by Devin Stack Author's Note I would like to say this is a work of fiction. This is not a prediction of the future or even a fantasy of the present. It's just a story. And any connection to real world events, places, or people are just coincidences. Nothing more. Enjoy. Chapter 2 Don't say it, Dave. When Wayne said, holding back a smug smile. The acoustics of the cave played tricks with the voice and made Wayne sound as if his words were being amplified through a possessed karaoke machine. Say what? asked Dave sheepishly. Dave hated getting into, the co into these conversations with Wayne. They weren't what you would call arguments. They were more like high-pressure sales pitches. Wayne had a kind of manic charisma that he used to overwhelm his opponents. Shock and awe. How does that make us any better than them? Wayne said with a mocking voice. That is what you were going to say, right? Well, it, it's true, Dave stammered. It's true that every so-called conservative has been using that line as an excuse to lose for the last 50 years, Wayne sneered. But it's definitely not true. Wayne removed a pack of cigarettes from his jacket pocket and extracted must have been what must have been the last one. He crushed the empty box in his hand and tossed it on the floor of the tunnel before placing the cigarette between his lips. The two had both smoked their first cigarettes in these caves nearly 15 years ago. Dave had never really liked smoking, but Wayne had pressured him into it that day when they had stolen a pack of camel wides from the corner store all those years ago. Wayne still smoked from time to time when he was under a lot of pressure. Dave wondered if his friend still smoked camels. He thought it was strange he didn't know. Despite all the time they had spent together, they were both very different people. And there were many things that Dave didn't know about Wayne. There was even more that Wayne didn't know about him. That's what they need you to believe, Wayne said as he lit the cigarette and then thrust it in Dave's direction like he was wielding a knife. You think it's any coincidence that in every post-apocalyptic movie and TV show, there's always some scene dripping with forced emotion where the good guys wrestle with morality of doing what every single person watching at home knows instinctively what needs to be done. Like, in The Lumbering Dead, the what? Oh, right, the zombie show. David never liked zombie fiction. Something about their dead eyes rattled him. The child zombies especially. Yeah. And don't even get me started on why the zombies... Wayne's arms flew up involuntarily with exasperation. Why? Who uses zombies 
Dave wondered. If Wayne was about to launch into one of those speeches about who really controlled Hollywood. Not that Wayne didn't have some good points, but it seemed like an unwinnable battle to Dave. The writers, the directors, there's a reason they were pushing that whole zombie meme for so long. But I don't want to go off on a tangent. Focus, Dave. Wayne's angry tone appeared at odds with his light-hearted expression. Dave had the feeling this was another one of Wayne's tactics. It seemed intentional that he would create socially bewildering interactions with people to keep them on their toes. But whether it was a calculated tactic or just Wayne amusing himself, Dave would never know. In every single one of these zombie movies and TV shows, the good group always comes across some dangerous scumbag. Wayne continued, someone that everyone in the audience at home knows is bad news. Someone that will end up being trouble if the group shows mercy when they have a reason and opportunity to kill him. Wayne glared at Dave expectantly, and Dave nodded that he understood. And then every single time, it's the same scene, Wayne's voice echoed in the darkness. Bad guy does something fucked up and gets caught. Like, maybe he attacks a member of the group. Or uses one of them as a human shield to save his own skin when the zombies come. Something really fucked up that leads people to dying. And everyone at home is shouting at their television because they know... The good guys just need to cut out the cancer before it does more damage. Wayne seemed genuinely exasperated, as if he had a particular episode in his mind's eye that he was mentally viewing at this very moment. Dave hadn't seen many of the zombie shows, but he had seen enough horror films to understand the frustration. He figured that if the characters in the movies acted rationally, they wouldn't be very long movies. Maybe the people that liked the horror genre also enjoyed being frustrated. Frustration is a kind of suspense, Dave thought. And the good guys, Wayne made it clear what he thought of the good guys with his mocking voice returning briefly. These so-called good guys. They have a ridiculous crisis of conscience that takes up half an episode where they wrestle with the morality of it all. Wayne said in an exaggerated tone holding his hands against his heart, and the burden of dealing with the situation the way it needs to be dealt with. Wayne's hands dropped to his sides, defeated. Then he whispered, and every single time they hesitate, Wayne stared directly at Dave with that unnerving intensity. And every single time, the bad guy ends up doing more fucked up shit. Maybe he even kills off a main character or two. Before the group finally does what they should have done in the first place. Wayne's frustration disappeared for a moment as he took a long drag from his cigarette. 
His face was red with the light of the glowing cherry. He seemed to be studying Dave, looking for something he didn't see. The frustration returned to his face slowly, and then he exhaled with a sigh. But then, he shouted, then, just as you start to think, they have finally learned their lesson. The good guys spend the rest of the episode feeling guilty about doing what needed to be done. They actually feel guilty for offing the bad guy. Wayne was shouting in disbelief, always so anguished and questioning whether or not they did the right thing, and even crying about it. There is so much crying in these fucking zombie shows. It's the same formula over and over and over again. It's literally the plot line to the majority of the Lumbering Dead episodes. Wayne lamented, sounding genuinely disappointed. I still don't get what this has to do with what we're talking about, complained Dave. Dave wasn't being completely honest, but he was hoping that he was wrong. What do you not get? It's exactly what we're talking about. We're the good guys. It's obvious what needs to be done. But here you are, with your guts twisted in knots, literally saying the kind of shit these characters say before the bad guy kills their best friend because they were all too busy staring off into the distance to the sound of sad piano music. Wayne's expression radiated disgust and crying and wringing their hands about becoming the bad guy. How long do these bad guys have to win before you admit that they have the fucking right idea? Is it so hard to admit maybe they're right? Wayne waited for an answer. It's not like we can just start killing people, David said, hoping this was all a joke. Why? Wayne let the word hang in the air. The last reverberating echo was silenced by the darkness that surrounded them. Is that what the elites say to each other before a few witnesses shoot themselves in the back of the head or accidentally drop barbells on themselves crushing their head or their windpipes? Why do you think these cases never go beyond the media calling it a suicide or an accident or a botched robbery? Why do you think nothing ever happens? Wayne took a drag from his cigarette and raised his eyebrows expectantly. Dave, unsure how, of how to respond, simply mirrored Wayne's expression. Because that's how things get done, Dave. That's how things have always been done. And that's how things will always be done. And if you want to play at making history, that's just what you do. That's the real secret knowledge that's kept from the public. That's the key to their unlearned, unearned power. You're being serious. Jesus. 
I, I, of course I'm being serious, Wayne exhaled, another generous helping of smoke. With nowhere to go, the nicotine tendrils joined the rest of the cloud that had been forming in the tunnel above their heads. I'm sure you're familiar with the saying, if you can't beat them, join them. Dave nodded quietly. Well, I was thinking about that the other day. At first, it seemed like a shitty thing to say, to just abandon your principles and change loyalties at the first sign of defeat. But I don't think that's what it means at all. Wayne smiled and took another slow drag from his cigarette. It means you must learn from your enemy. Use the weapons they use. If yours aren't working. I don't mean just how they use propaganda like we've learned to do. I mean how they really rule. What do they do to people that get in the way? Dave wondered for a moment if Wayne was putting him on. He let out a sigh of relief. There was no way Wayne was being serious. He was just fucking with him, right? Nobody can hear us, Dave. Why do you think I had you leave your phone at home? Why do you think we are here? We have big boy problems that require big boy solutions. Before you say anything, answer this. Tell me, what's the difference between you and Alice Green? Well, for one thing, I'm not a murderer, Dave began. Wrong answer. Besides, Alice Green is not a murderer, Wayne said, cutting him off with a smug look. The hell she isn't, Dave said, confused. Then why isn't she in jail? Wayne shot back. Dave considered the question for a moment. The answer was obvious to him, but he knew that whatever he said would be wrong. Wayne had been driving him towards a conclusion at full throttle, but he was still unclear as to where he was going. Because some people are above the law, I guess, Dave stammered. Wayne made a loud noise, imitating a game show buzzer. Wrong again. You see, this is your problem. Alice Green isn't above the law. She cannot defy gravity. She cannot travel through time. She can't walk through walls. She is subject to all the same laws that you and I are subject to. You just don't understand the laws, so you are constrained by what you think the laws are, he said. I'm pretty sure murder is against the law, Dave said, exasperated. You play a lot of computer games, right? Wayne asked. This sudden change in subject threw Dave's mind off track. As thoughts went through from contemplating the morality of murder to the hundreds of thousands of virtual murders he had committed in online games over the years. Not, not, not so much these days. Have you ever had the experience where you were playing a new multiplayer game online 
you're just starting to get good at the game when you see another player do something that seems impossible. They do something so outside of the scope of your experience that you are now convinced the player is cheating. You are certain that they are cheating. You might pound your fist in the keyboard and rage at how unfair it is that you spent so much time getting good at the game, and here they are cheating. You. You might even rage quit because it seems so unfair. Wayne chuckled to himself as if remembering some distant memory. But then one day, maybe even because you're trying to catch them cheating so you, rec you can report their account, you figure out what they're doing. Dave instantly thought of a game he played in college. He had always liked the first-person shooters and considered himself a formidable player at the time. He almost always finished games in the top three and often finished in first place. Without shame, Dave had spent hours and hours and hours in these virtual worlds developing skills that would never really translate to the real world. He recalled a specific time in his gaming career when there had been an update pushed out that had introduced a new glitch into the game. A glitch that had somehow slipped past the beta testers. This glitch allowed players who knew just the right spot to crawl inside one of the walls in the virtual battlefield. This gave the player the power of invincibility over the other players who were playing by the rules. Shots could be fired from inside the wall, killing the players who were unable to see those who had snuck inside the wall, or where the shots were even coming from. What made the glitch even more maddening was that the physics used in the game engine prevented any return fire from ever hitting the players that had snuck inside the wall. The players who exploited the glitch were utterly untouchable. Dave admitted to himself that when he had first encountered the players doing this, destroying his stats by repeatedly killing him from inside the wall, he had thought that they were using some kind of private cheating software. He was just about to call it quits, when entirely by dumb luck he witnessed a player crawling into the wall. The secret was out. Dave followed after the cheater. Once Dave was in on the trick, he abused it like all the others. Dave had fond memories of gunning people down until he ran out of ammo. Everyone in the chat window called him a cheater. Eventually, the game developer had fixed the glitch with a new patch, and the playing field was equalized once again. After it was gone, he had to admit he missed the exploit and the advantage that it had given him, even if it had been just a cheap trick. They weren't cheating at all, Wing continued. As if he was reading Dave's mind, they simply discovered a clever trick that was available to anyone that knew about it. An exploit that gave them an advantage over those who didn't know the trick. I'll concede that, but they weren't cheating. 
they weren't playing by different rules. The rules of the game still applied to them. They were just exploiting the ignorance of the other players like you. Who didn't know the rules as well as they knew them. Dave was beginning to understand. And he didn't like where this was going. That's precisely what Alice Green and all these other fuckers just like her are doing. They know how to exploit the weakness in the system and take advantage of the people that don't. So you can get pissed off and call her a cheater and cry about how she's not in jail or you can start using the same exploits she uses to stay in power. Wayne said with a quiet intensity. This isn't a fucking video game, Dave said. You're right, Wayne shouted. This is way more fucking important than a video game. If this was a video game, you would be all over this. You'd be willing to do what needed to be done to win. But because this is real life, you're just going to roll over and take it in the ass and cry about how they're cheating. The worst part is, you know I'm right. You're not right, Dave mumbled. What's getting in the way, Dave? Is it superstition? Are you afraid Santa Claus won't bring you any presents if you're not a good little boy? Has it ever occurred to you that the ruling class invented those stories to keep you playing by the rules? Ever wonder why so many nations implemented official religions? Do you really think it was because they were pious? Wayne let out a, f a genuine belly laugh that startled Dave. You think people like the Pope aren't in all in on all of this? Yeah, you know I'm right. That's why you're pissed off. You know I'm right. And you're not so innocent. I'm not pissed off. It's, it's just you should be pissed off. Santa Claus isn't real, Dave. Alice Green gets more presents than you do because she knows this and acts accordingly. Meanwhile, everyone else plays by different rules. The worst part is, they do it by choice. Wayne examined Dave's face. He recognized Dave's look of shock. It wasn't precisely what he was going for, but really... In the end, it didn't matter. This sick bastard had always played the innocent card. It wouldn't work this time. Plus, this was a good practice run. Things were progressing about as well as he had predicted. This was a deal that never needed to be closed anyway. Remember when Green was running against Wilson in New York? And she was way behind in the polls? Wayne's voice had, a sh had shed the aggressive tone that had been building. He sounded conversational again. Casual, even. People were wondering why she wasn't even running. 
and why big-time donors kept giving her money. And then what happened? Yeah, Dave relaxed slightly. Bam! Out of nowhere. Wilson's plane crashes, killing everyone on board, and Green wins in a landslide against the Republican because it was New York, and they've been demographically fucked for decades. Wayne took another drag from his cigarette, then tilted his head back slowly and exhaled. Yeah. People were calling bullshit back then, but nobody could prove anything. Me called everyone a conspiracy nut that even brought it up, Dave said, remembering the headlines clearly. Right. Because, don't you see, Dave? It was just an accident. Why would you go to jail if your opponent died in an accident? That's the exploit. The rule isn't that you can't kill people that get in your way when you want to be a senator. That's the rule if you're a sucker. The rule is they just have to die in an accident. That's fucked up, Dave said. War is fucked up, Wayne returned. In fact, in many ways, war is just a contest to see who can be the most fucked up. These mental blocks that keep you in line are the only thing separating us from them. It's funny, because you complain all the time that there are different rules from them and, the, and that laws don't apply to them. I'm just agreeing with you. The real red pill is, there are no laws. The laws are just self-imposed limitations we put on ourselves. If you really want to beat him, you have to free yourself from these imaginary boundaries. And this moral code they designed to keep us in line and start playing on their level. If you can't beat him, join him, Dave whispered breathlessly. He wasn't convinced, but he was beginning to see Wayne's point. And he had to admit, there was a definite logic to it. It's just like speeding, Wayne said. What do you mean, asked Dave. Think back to when you first got your license, and you decided to speed for the first time. I remember when I did. It was in my mom's old minivan. <laughs> you remember that thing? Wayne could still feel the embarrassment of being seen in that van. I remember it had wood paneling on the sides, Dave said, smiling. I was convinced I would be caught immediately. I was constantly checking my mirrors for flashing lights, like the cops would somehow be all alerted to the moment I went over the speed limit. But then I realized everyone speeds. You figure out it's only speeding when you get caught. And really, the only time you get caught is when you're being stupid about it. No. Some of us have morals. I'm not afraid to kill people because I think I'll get caught. Afraid? See? It is fear, Wayne said smugly. That's not what I meant. Dave hated these debates. Sure. Sure it is. And you're right. You're not afraid of killing people because you're afraid of being caught. All that's, Although that's why you're not afraid to do some other things. 
with killing, it's worse than that. You're afraid of Santa Claus. In fact, here's the real fucked up thing about your people, Dave. People like me? Dave tried to sound offended. Yeah, people like you. Wayne shot back without hesitation. You act like you're so positive that Santa Claus exists that not only are you afraid to do what needs to be done because you want to live and you want your presence, you feel no sense of urgency in stopping evil in this life. You're convinced that it will all get worked out in the next life by some magical Jew that died 2,000 years ago. How fucking convenient. I wonder who that works out for. I wonder who that philosophy could possibly benefit. Just because the ruling class is trying to mutilate their version of God that you prefer now, the version that worked out for them for so long in the past, doesn't mean that they aren't the ones that invented him in the first place to keep you in line. So yes, people like you. Hiding behind fear and superstition. Bedtime stories for peasants. Don't worry about your life being complete shit show. Be grateful for what you have. Turn the other cheek, and things will get better when you're dead. In the meantime, do as you're told, slave. After all, the meek shall inherit the earth. So, get on your knees, and just have faith that whatever happens is God's will. What happened to you? Dave was in shock. I woke the fuck up, Dave. Sometimes I wish I hadn't. Do you really believe in God? Wayne asked calmly. Of course, Dave said unconvincingly. Good. A shot rang out and echoed loudly against the walls of the cave. It was the loudest sound Dave could ever remember hearing. Dave felt the sensation of falling, but something was different. It wasn't quite like falling. It was more like the sensation you felt just before falling asleep at your desk in class. That rushing feeling accompanied by a jolt of adrenaline that forced your eyes back open. Where had Wayne gone? Just a moment ago, he had been looking into those intense green eyes, but now something seemed strange. He had a sense of deja vu he couldn't quite place. This was going to drive him crazy. What did this remind him of? Dave racked his brain, and then it came to him. Years ago, when he and Wayne had been teenagers, they had set up a camera on a tripod so they could film themselves getting, getting drunk. This was several years before camera phones and social media had taught people the hard way not to record themselves in embarrassing and illegal situations. Things seemed so simple then. The next morning, when David Wayne had been fighting off hangovers with leftover tacos from the night before, they anxious, anxiously popped the tape into the VCR. He remembered how excited they had both been as they waited for the tape to rewind. The 
two were looking forward to reliving the previous night's debauchery through the miracle of VHS video. Relive it they did. For about five minutes. That's when the tape showed Wayne getting angry after Dave had objected to the to one of the rules of the drinking game they'd been playing. Things quickly escalated and Wayne eventually took a swing at Dave. But missed accidentally and hit the camera, knocking it to the floor. Apparently, in their drunken state, they hadn't noticed this. The remaining 55 minutes of the tape consisted only of an extreme close-up shot of the shag carpet and part of a table leg. Dave wondered why he was reminded at that moment so many years ago. Then, he wondered nothing at all. End of chapter 2